The Mass Effect trilogy centers around the civilizations of the galaxy and their struggle to survive against the Reapers, an overwhelming force bent on their eradication. For most of the series, however, we learn little of these doomsday devices besides their capabilities and their plans. In this video, I'll start at the beginning and look at the Reapers, who they are, where they came from, and how they, for all practical purposes, built the Mass Effect universe. The Leviathan were the earliest known dominant species of the galaxy. No exact timeline is given for their existence, but they ruled the galaxy about a billion years ago, perhaps more. Their physical form alone commands attention. They are massive in size, with an otherworldly appearance that resembles Lovecraftian cuttlefish, with additional qualities of anthropods, such as a thick outer shell and multiple appendages protruding from multiple bodily segments. Behind this intimidating form lies an immensely powerful and sophisticated creature. Leviathan possess the ability to block out electronic communications. They are further capable of EMP-like bursts, capable of rendering even the most advanced machinery completely inert. Modern scientists believe them to communicate via their own form of quantum entanglement, a technology that would take other species eons to develop. These behemoths also demonstrated the first documented instance of sophisticated mind control. A creature under Leviathan's control would follow their master's directives completely and without question. These subjects served in their thrall, supported their interests, and spread their influence. To maintain dominance throughout the galaxy, the Leviathan further delivered artifacts to different systems to amplify their signals and direct subjects light years away. We do gain some insight into what these thralls experience. The available text demonstrates that they exhibit a total subordination to the Leviathan artifacts and the will behind them. They further discard any traits of their former personalities, even going so far as to no longer feel the need for basic necessities such as food. Additionally, these subjects recall feelings of cold and dark sensations that show up even before the mind control fully takes hold. This befits the aquatic environment in which the Leviathan reside. This further highlights the overwhelming presence of the Leviathan's immensely powerful minds. Direct control thralls could last years or even decades with little to no degradation in function. If necessary, the Leviathan could even wipe all memory of what took place while under their control. The Leviathan refer to tribute that their thralls provided, but do not specify exactly what this entails. This could refer to labor, particularly when it comes to services required for the conquest of other species, either militarily or through the delivery of artifacts. This could also refer to resources, particularly Element Zero, a substance that enables faster-than-light travel and biotic abilities, it is even possible, though I emphasize neither stated nor implied, that the Leviathan may have fed off of sacrifices of their thrall species, much like an ancient civilization might offer up one of their own into a volcano. At the height of their power, the lesser species revered them as gods, a view shared by the Leviathan themselves. When asked directly what they are, their answer is simple. Something more. Despite their awesome power, the Leviathan were not omnipotent, their mind control was not absolute, and their imagination and planning had limits. Or as they would put it, we could not protect them from themselves. Lesser species continued to advance in ways that the Leviathan could not really anticipate. Technological innovation continued from these subjects based on their own needs. These subjects, in time, developed artificial intelligence which surpassed then destroyed them. This displeased the ancient behemoths, not as a matter of sympathy, but one of practicality. The Leviathan spokesman puts it simply, tribute does not flow from a dead race. Their response was simple, the Leviathan would build their own intelligence to oversee this problem. We do not learn the exact nature and parameters of this design, but the mandate it receives is both broad and far-reaching. Preserve life at any cost. 
When asked why they viewed themselves as immune from the cycle that claimed others, their answer is rather simple, hubris. It must be noted that even in real life, artificial intelligence is not a disinterested objective force, but rather reflects those that design it. The Leviathan's level of concern for their thrall species comes through in how they respond to the destruction of multiple civilizations. In short, the fact that they outsource any responsibility for their servants' continued existence to an AI gives us a hint as to how much they valued these lives in the first place. With the Leviathan viewing themselves as no less than gods, it is only natural that an intelligence created by them would seek a solution befitting a being far above those of lesser species. Furthermore, even in real life, any machine learning model is ultimately only as good as the data being fed into it. In the case of this new intelligence, the data apparently consisted of civilizations under the thumb of the Leviathan themselves. On top of all this, these models can behave in unpredictable ways based on how the data going in interacts with the internal workings of the system. Depending on the complexity involved, it can be difficult or even impossible to decipher the exact manner in which a model reaches a given conclusion and to prevent certain outcomes. Ultimately, this intelligence came to a stark conclusion about the course of organic life. In short, organic life will inevitably destroy itself. The needs and wants of organics result in new, more sophisticated, and more powerful technology. This technology will, without fail, gain superiority over those that create it and come to destroy them. The goal, then, is not to prevent this entirely, but instead find an alternate means to preserve the ascendant species before it reaches this point. With its creators unaware of what they set loose, the AI embarked upon its own mission. While Leviathan continued to lord over its subjects, the intelligence put a plan in motion with two main components. The first component was to develop mind control, similar to the Leviathan's, but refined for its own purposes. The second phase was to utilize this indoctrination, develop its own army of organic thralls, and unleash them against their former gods. What followed was the wholesale slaughter of the Leviathan species, known as the First Harvest. This harvest stored the genetic, historical, and technological data of the Leviathan to manufacture a synthetic body. Constructed in the likeness of its own creators, this vessel captured the physical appearance and voice of the Leviathan species, enhanced with the strongest offensive weaponry available and near impenetrable armor. This being would be more powerful than any other recorded in the Mass Effect universe. In the modern cycle, it would be known as the Reaper Harbinger. Despite the apparent betrayal of its creators, the AI claimed this solution matched their parameters. The Leviathan were preserved because their knowledge and genetic data were stored and cataloged in this new body. In this way, the letter of the mission to preserve life at all cost was met, if not the spirit in which it was chartered. However, the first harvest also represented a significant mistake on the part of the intelligence. Despite its intent to exterminate the entire Leviathan species, there remained remnants who escaped this slaughter. These survivors hid in remote locations in the galaxy and directed their remaining thralls to destroy any evidence of their existence. In time, the survivors managed to reproduce. In the modern cycle, the descendants are found in the aquatic planet of 2181 Despoina, which remained largely unexplored since. This lack of exploration was by design, as the resident Leviathan blocked any and all signals and electronics it detected so as to remain hidden. As powerful as they were, these survivors were in no rush to engage for Reapers again either from the shock of their original conflict or their experience hiding from their creation over the coming years, they viewed the Reapers as largely unassailable. Their desire to remain hidden led them to disable vessels that entered the atmosphere and use their powers to mentally enslave these survivors, if, that is, they left any. Here, they would watch and wait, acting only to gather their own agents, cover their tracks, 
and hide from the cycle of slaughter that would plague the galaxy for the next billion years. In this first harvest, the intelligence conceived not just means to preserve organic civilizations, but essentially birthed a new species. While calling it a species might stretch the definition of a word somewhat, it is a useful framework. Reapers are a single unit of classification, much like bees, horses, and others. While certain variants and roles exist among reapers, they share certain biological characteristics and cooperate among themselves to reproduce. In this case, reaper reproduction serves as the process in which to implement the designs of the intelligence that created them. Reaper reproduction follows a construction-like process. Reapers and their servants herd members of a desired species into a processing center and essentially dissolve them into a sort of paste. The facility then pipes this paste into a chamber in which they form the interior core of the new reaper. This core mimics the shape of the species from which it is formed, much like Harbinger resembles the visage of a leviathan. The Mass Effect lore does not explain how reapers reproduce their outer shells or the materials they use. We cannot rule out the inclusion of organic materials like those used to build the reaper core. However, given the common appearance and design, it is quite possible that they use metallic alloys instead of the core's genetic paste. Reapers are massive in size. They range from hundreds of meters up to two kilometers in length. While variants exist among the design, all reapers take after Harbinger in that they share physical characteristics of Leviathan. Reapers have a primary body divided into different sections, tentacles that protrude in parallel among their front-facing segments, along with eye-like structures, all centered around a sort of head that faces forward and down upon their targets. The outer shell of a reaper consists of extremely durable armor supplemented by formidable kinetic barriers capable of withstanding all but the most powerful barrages of the galaxy's militaries. Depending on the variant, the reaper has one or more magneto-hydrodynamic cannon. These cannons that fire volleys of molten hot metal at what is described as speeds a fraction of the speed of light. Even if this is just 1% of the speed of light, this would still clock in at about 3 million meters per second. For context, that is about a thousand times faster than the fastest known real-life railguns. This concept is not unique to Reapers, as military firearms in the Mass Effect universe utilize similar concepts. Unsurprisingly, however, Reaper cannons emit much more powerful bursts and can shoot through nearly any opposing ship with ease. Furthermore, Reapers, along with devices that they create and even organics under their thrall, emit signals that can subliminally sway their victims to their cause. This process, termed indoctrination, serves various purposes. It can break the morale of opposing forces, recruit servants and disposable shock troops, and even enlist powerful officials to become high-value agents in their campaigns. As mentioned, Reapers consist of multiple variants or classes. Capital ships are the crown jewels of a Reaper armada. The largest and most powerful of Reaper ships, capital ships span two kilometers, wield multiple cannons mounted on their tentacles and head, and can even hold crews within their cavernous interiors. These ships come from the primary species of a given harvest. Not every species can form a capital ship. Instead, a species must fit certain genetic criteria in order for the Reapers to construct such a vessel. Even some of the most advanced species in galactic history do not qualify. While capital ships are the crown jewels of the Reaper armada, destroyer-class Reapers form the offensive backbone of a Reaper invasion. Reapers build destroyer-class Reapers from certain species that are not suitable to become capital ships, but still fit for Reaper construction. While capital ships wield multiple cannons among its tentacles, destroyers wield a single ocular cannon. 
These eyes form something of a weak spot on the Reaper, which it compensates for by shielding when not in use. Unlike capital ships, the appendages of destroyer ships act as legs on which the Reaper can walk across the surface of a planet. Destroyers do have a similarity to capital ships in that they also contain interior rooms in which to hold crews or even equipment. These characteristics make destroyers particularly well-suited to lead Reaper ground invasions. After they land on a target planet, destroyers release hordes of indoctrinated and repurposed shock troops while they themselves lay out devastating blasts at enemy ships, buildings, and troop formations. Hades cannons appear to be a subtype of destroyers, or perhaps modified destroyers themselves, as they share certain physical traits. These cannons act as surface-to-air defense systems after Reapers land planetside. It is unclear exactly what level of sentience Hades cannons possess, but at a minimum they appear to aim at targets independently. Unlike capital ships and destroyers, troop transports and processor ships are not believed to be intelligent or even self-aware. Rather, tech suggests that these ships are controlled remotely, either by capital ships or by the broader Reaper Collective in general. These ships follow a somewhat similar construction as destroyers, i.e. the Reapers will repurpose a species not suitable for creating a capital ship into one of these utility vessels, turning them into the same sort of tool used in their own extermination. The appearance of both classes of ship are largely conjecture, as the players do not interact with or view either during the events of a Mass Effect series. However, their purpose is invaluable in Reaper society, so to speak, as they form the logistical backbone of each successive harvest. Troop transports, like the name implies, are vessels designed to move shock troops planetside. While capital ships and destroyers can also house troops, troop transports appear to support a much larger capacity as their forms are completely dedicated to this task rather than offensive weaponry or information processing. Their size varies from ship to ship. Some are about the size of destroyers, about 200 meters in length, while others are more comparable in size to capital ships, up to one kilometer. After the Reapers subdue a planet's defenses and hurt its population, these transports serve a new grim purpose in which they load up living organics and move them to processing centers. Processors, meanwhile, are the final destination of any captured organics. These ships contain facilities and equipment that dissolve their victims into the genetic paste from which the Reapers will carry out their reproduction. This purpose gives processors another name among organics, slaughter ships. The capacity of processors along with those of other facilities that Reapers and their forces construct over the course of a harvest allow them to kill millions of organics on a daily basis, ultimately enabling the complete extermination of a species in a matter of years. During the events of Mass Effect 1, Sovereign offers the best explanation of the Reaper's self-image. We have no beginning. We have no end. We are infinite. Like the Leviathan before them, the Reapers view themselves as no less than gods. Compared to the organics they harvest, they may as well be. Each Reaper is composed of the genetic and technological material of a harvested organic species containing the raw essence of millions or perhaps billions of individuals. The Reapers have existed eons before every galactic civilization with no end in sight. The Reapers spent the past billion years creating more of their kind with no defined threshold as to how much further they can go. Their lifespans also have no set limit. Reapers could theoretically exist indefinitely until entropy claims the galaxy, perhaps beyond. Their power, durability, and intelligence dwarfs those of organics, but Reapers still have limits of their own. For starters, despite their awesome power, they are not invincible. 
Reaper shields can take more damage than any structure in the galaxy besides the citadel or perhaps the mass relays, but organic weapons can still penetrate them with enough concentrated and or sustained force. While it may be rare for organics to disable or destroy a reaper, it has happened in the course of galactic history. Additionally, reapers require a tremendous amount of energy to operate. In order to support their own mass while traversing a planet, reapers must divert power from their shields. Dividing tasks, such as controlling a separate body, can divert even more kinetic and computational power. Reapers can sustain operation over the course of a harvest, decades, centuries, perhaps a few millennia, but not the full span of a galactic cycle, which is typically 50,000 years. The reapers therefore preserve themselves between cycles by entering a state of hibernation. The problem with this, however, is that when a reaper shuts down to hibernate, it is vulnerable to attack. To compensate for this, the reapers retreat to dark space in between cycles. Here, they conserve energy until the next harvest. In the meantime, they leave behind a solitary sentinel to monitor the progress of the next ascendant species. This sentinel monitors interstellar communications and waits for a new species to grow and advance to the point where they become suitable for a new harvest. Court of a Reaper plan is the construction of a mass relay network. The timing and process of its construction, whether it began shortly after the Leviathan's defeat or millions of years later, is unknown. What we do know is that the relays form a massive, hyper-advanced grid that spans the Milky Way galaxy. The relays run on Element Zero, a fictional substance that can alter the mass of any object. This mass effect enables ships to travel between relays near instantaneously and even allows spacecraft to travel to the far corners of the galaxy in a matter of minutes or even seconds. These mass relays form a grid that offers organics both a literal highway around the galaxy as well as a figurative pathway for a civilization to grow and develop. The central hub of the mass relay network is the Citadel. This Citadel, perhaps taking inspiration from the real-life Pentagon, is a massive space station that consists of five arms docked around a central ring that houses a massive presidium and tower. This station houses a vast network of physical docks, structures, and facilities capable of supporting tens of millions of living creatures. The central chambers are themselves ideal for ceremonial and administrative purposes. Given its invaluable utility, it forms the natural center of galactic governance. Unbeknownst to the Citadel's inhabitants, it also houses systems that coordinate the mass relay network. Most importantly, the Citadel houses a mass relay that leads to dark space beyond the Milky Way galaxy, where Reapers hibernate between harvests. We never see this process take place, but the Reapers presumably travel either directly into the Presidium or somewhere below its base. What you see here is a speculative video of what this process may look like by animator username Jerry. I'll include a link in the description. The Citadel is further capable of fast transport from a planet's surface without the aid of spacefaring vessels. This presumably also occurs via Mass Effect technology. These secret functions make it necessary to hide certain features from organics. Certain low-level functionality is therefore inscrutable by design. Navigation, life support, and other essential functions are all automated and require no outside input. In technological terms, this serves as a black box. In other words, a system in which a user understands how to interact with it, what commands to send, and what responses they receive, but not the system's internal workings. Ultimately, each civilization that discovers the Citadel is left to assume that the previous civilization built it themselves. The Presidium Tower serves as the Citadel's beating heart, the crown jewel of the Citadel, and, in the modern cycle, home to the Citadel Council overseeing galactic interests. The tower houses programs capable of maintaining the function of the entire station, and is the home to a servant species known as the Keepers. The Keepers' exact origin is a matter of speculation and not made explicit throughout the series. They could be an early harvested civilization, or perhaps they were designed by the Reapers specifically for Citadel maintenance, or perhaps some combination of the two. 
Chorban, an amateur Salarian scientist in the modern cycle, compares them to pieces of a reaper. He surmises that they share the same creator and are as old as the citadel itself, but we do not know if that is truly the case. The keepers are entirely utilitarian in purpose. They are dedicated to the construction, upkeep, and repair of its citadel. They further maintain biomass recycling vets. Keepers reproduce for the sole purpose of maintaining their current numbers to continue their duties, and primarily reside in the Presidium Tower. The keepers share an apparent hive mind with an intricate knowledge of the citadel topology and functionality. They move about using a hidden network of paths leading to every corner of a construct, both known and unknown to its organic inhabitants. These tunnels are mostly uncharted, and those who attempt to explore and or hide in these labyrinthine walkways typically wind up missing or dead. The capabilities of the Keepers render organic intervention of the Citadel unnecessary, even obsolete. Further, they resist study and, if captured, self-destruct. For this reason, the Citadel Council forbids residents to interact with them in any way. Eventually, any species inhabiting the Citadel will come to view them as integral to their daily lives, but not worth further scrutiny until it is too late. While the Reapers hibernate, the advanced species eventually discover Mass Effect technology. These species then proceed to learn how to perform faster than light travel. As their travel advances, they soon discover the Mass Effect relays and eventually the Citadel. The convenience and functionality of the Citadel means that the station becomes the civilization's hub going forward. Meanwhile, the Citadel's internal complexity, combined with the utility of the Keepers, means that a new galactic government has little reason or means to investigate its functionality too deeply and make any discoveries that could prove inconvenient to the Reaper's plans. As time passes, the civilization grows and advances while a designated Reaper Sentinel observes. This Sentinel can survive the cycle with the resources available to it, and as necessary, will lure and indoctrinate potential allies to serve its needs. The Sentinel tracks the progress of the organic civilizations, and when the species has advanced far enough, they signal the beginning of the harvest. The Reaper harvest begins when the Sentinel sends a predetermined signal to the Keepers. The Keepers, acting according to their programming, open the Citadel's internal mass relay to dark space. At this time, the Reapers instantly transport through the Citadel Relay, decapitate the unsuspecting galactic government, and mine data for intel on the existing species. The Reapers destroy or harvest those that they wish at the outset and indoctrinate the rest, turning them into agents and tools. These indoctrinated forces destroy the remaining organic forces from within and without through sabotage, betrayal, or simple brute force. The organic species governments and militaries, which are caught unprepared, quickly fall to the overwhelming military superiority, insidious indoctrination, and relentless brutality of Reapers. As opposition falls, the organic species extinction accelerates. The Reapers harvest the technology, organic matter, and genetic substance of their targets. They then utilize this raw material to construct a new Reaper, which contains the knowledge and DNA of the harvested species. Finally, after this extermination and reproduction is complete, the last stage is to erase any evidence of their existence. As we'll discuss another time, a number of planets throughout the galaxy show signs of prior civilizations, but with only vague evidence as to how they ended. Some, in particular, show evidence of orbital bombardment, at times so thorough that the atmosphere itself was all but destroyed. Now, this could be a means of killing off a planet's inhabitants if Reapers don't wish to harvest them, but it could also be a means of destroying any evidence as to what took place on the planet when the Reapers first arrived. Much of Reaper history is simply a matter of speculation. 
As it stands, the exact timeline of their harvest and growth as a species is unknown. The lore's texts, combined with the existence of thousands of reapers along with an estimated 50,000 year time span of each cycle, suggests about a billion years, perhaps more, but there is no way to be sure without more information. Also unknown is how frequently the reapers lose any of their own. The lore suggests few cases in which organics manage to destroy even a single reaper during prior harvest, but again, we cannot come up with any reliable estimates based on the limited data that we have. Our best guess is that the reapers typically pulled off a harvest with few losses, if any at all. What we do know is that the reapers set themselves as the galaxy's single dominant form of life. In the cycles of harvest that they created over the eons, they turned organic life into something that fulfilled all of their needs, a source of labor, a form of livestock, an infinite pool of resources, and their means of reproduction. These all combined to provide the reapers with an instinctual purpose, much like organic species act, so that they may survive and pass on their genes. For eons, the story of organic life in the Milky Way galaxy was one of civilizations rising up from the bounds of their planet, reaching out into the furthest stars, building civilizations that cross the breadth of the galaxy, only to suddenly and horrifically get snuffed out and join the ranks of their destroyers. I hope that you enjoyed this video. This was a project that grew larger than I expected, but parts of the work involved will actually spin off into my next essay, which will look at galactic history before the modern cycle. As always, feel free to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. It will really help the channel in the future. Also, feel free to like and subscribe if you don't. I'm not going to stop you. Thanks for watching.